Welcome to the recording of a presentation provided to integrated pest managers interested in controlling pocket gophers and voles on school property. The strategies that I present here are designed to help those that are controlling pocket gophers and voles in public spaces. Therefore, I'm limiting the ideas to those that I think are appropriate to be used in areas where people and pets may be exposed to those strategies. First, let's start with some pocket gopher and vole identification. Because animals often have different nicknames throughout the areas, it helps to make sure that we're talking about the same species. Here you see a species considered the sagebrush vole on the left and the bodice pocket gopher on the right. And we'll use them to identify some characteristics of these species. In general, Voles are shaped like mice, and in fact, they're often called meadow mice. So here on the vole, you can see an ear that's off, kind of shaped like a mouse, although it doesn't really stick out above its head, which is common in many mice species. Vole ears are rather small. They spend most of their time below ground, and so they don't want external features that are going to get covered in dirt or packed in with dirt. So their ears are generally just a little bit bigger than the size of their eyes. If we look at the nose of voles and pocket gophers, we also notice some differences. Voles are shaped a little bit pointed, again, much like a mouse. Pocket gophers have more of a blunt face. They also have long whiskers that are used to navigating their burrow systems. Pocket gophers also have fur-lined cheek pouches, hence the name pocket gopher. While pocket gophers spend most of their time below ground, they do come out of their holes to gather vegetation, which they shove inside these pockets and then return to the hole where they eat the vegetation that they had packed. Finally, we can often tell the difference between voles and pocket gophers by looking at their feet. Voles have relatively tiny feet, front feet and back feet, again very similar to what you would expect in a mouse. Pocket gophers, because they're subterranean and they're digging, they have feet that are adapted for that. So you'll see these large paddle-shaped feet with long claws that are associated with digging underground. We have eight species of voles in Utah. The most common is the long-tailed vole, which you can see here. It's about four and a half inches long and it's active year round. We have two common species in, of pocket gophers in Utah, the bodice pocket gopher and the northern pocket gopher. This species is a little bit longer than the voles, about six inches long, and it's also active year round. The fact that these two species are active year round is important to remember because this activity pattern allows them to potentially cause damage and control issues year round. Both the long tail vole and the bodice pocket gopher are found along the Wasatch Front and in areas that are highly populated by Utahns. Long tail voles are looking for more meadow habitat, agricultural areas, and areas that have a lot of easily accessible grasses and broadleaf plants such as flowers. Bodice pocket gophers are more concerned with finding soil that is easily tillable or soil that it can burrow through easily. So it wants what we call loamy soil. It's not too sandy, doesn't have too much clay, um, not very rocky. So they can burrow and excavate that soil. And they're not particularly concerned with what's growing above ground as long as there is something growing above ground. These two species do eat very similar foods, but they eat them in different ways. So this is going to change how we manage them based on the species. Voles are going to eat grasses, seeds, fungus, and then in the wintertime they often consume bark. But they run around and forage for these food items above ground. Pocket gophers eat the plants and the grasses much like the voles, and they eat shrubs and leaves. Um, but they also eat the roots of these plants as they grow into their tunnel. 
They'll also eat tubers and bulbs that they encounter as they build their tunnels. They spend most of their time underground. They exit their burrow to grab food above ground, which they put in their cheek pockets, and then they pull it inside. So they're not eating above ground, they're eating below ground. If we understand the biology of these two species, we can kind of use it to dictate how we're going to do our management. Voles begin breeding in early May and can breed through October. They gestate for anywhere between 20 to 28 days and give birth to two to six offspring. These offspring are sexually mature at three weeks. So every three weeks in May and October, you may see a cycle of young voles running around the area, dispersing, trying to find their mates. A female vole will usually have two broods in a given year. And they only live one year, so throughout the lifespan, a vole is going to have two broods. This sounds a little bit scary because it sounds like there could be a lot of voles running around at any given time. Um, but it may console you to know that they're solitary. So we're not going to see a nesting infestation of voles that we might see, say, in house mice or black rats. We do see cyclical fluctuations in vole populations every three to four years. So we'll have, you may have three to four years where you don't really see a lot of vole issues, and then suddenly you have this year where there's a lot of voles running around and that's when you notice a problem. If you wait, that population will crash and then you'll have another two to three years of low vole population. Pocket gophers do things a little bit more slowly. They begin breeding in April-ish. Uh, I say ish because it's dependent upon the climate. So if it's uh, very cold that year, very harsh winter, it may be pushed into mid-April. Again, if it's a drier year, not very much snow, things warm up and green up a little bit earlier, it could be uh, late March that they start breeding. They gestate roughly three to four weeks and uh, give birth to five to seven offspring. These offspring are sexually mature between three to six months, but they disperse from their natal burrow at two months of age. So you may see pocket gophers that were born in the end of April, early May, dispersing from their burrow where they were born around July, mid-July, early August. So it, you may not notice too much damage until you see these young pocket gophers dispersing kind of mid-summer, late summer. What does that damage look like? Well, let's look at a few of these things. So here we can see uh, a run, a, what is typically a vole run, and you'd see this after the snow melts. And I can tell that it's a vole run because there's feces in the run, which is fairly indicative of voles. In years with high populations, you'll see uh, a lot of damage. So here's all the different runs. And the reason why these were created is so that the voles could run above the surface of the ground while there was snow on the ground. So heavier snowpack, longer snowpack will cause more extensive damage because the voles have a longer time to set up those runs under the snow where they can eat year-round and be relatively safe from predators. I shouldn't say eat year-round, eat during the winter and be relatively safe from predators. There's not a lot of soil associated with a vole creating this burrow system. And in fact, this is what the general vole entrance to a burrow looks like. It doesn't, you can't really tell. There's not a lot of soil pushed up. It's just a hole in the ground associated with these runs. Conversely, this is what a pocket gopher burrow entrance might look like. So you have the plug of the pocket gopher and then you have these lateral underground tunnels that extend in different directions from that. So the pocket gopher has pushed the soil from the burrow above ground and then plugged that entrance so that it can be safe from predators. You can see here a diagram of 
the extensiveness of a pocket gopher burrow system. So a surface mound is just that, where you can see the soil push out. You might have an earth plug where the pocket gopher has exited the burrow to push its feces out or, or similar trash out of the burrow system and then just plugged it. But there isn't any soil displaced because that burrow was already constructed. They'll have several different nests um, and they'll have several different latrine type areas. So it can be fairly extensive with lots of dead ends. This gets tricky if you're trying to do fumigants or something to that effect. And we'll mention that rather quickly later on in the presentation. Here's what some of the damage looks like. Uh, often our concern with pocket gophers and trees is that they'll eat the roots of young trees as they create their burrow system. So here is a mound entrance and hypothetically this pocket gopher could be eating the roots around this tree. Even if it's not eating the roots of the tree, it is creating soil displacement and air pockets that could damage those roots and make the tree less stable. Many people see pocket gopher casings above the ground when the snow melts. This is from pocket gopher activity in the winter time. During the winter, the pocket gophers will move above ground on the surface of the ground underneath the snowpack and actually line their tunnels with the soil. So they will spend the entire winter under the snow with this, sub, with this above surface tunnel system. This allows them access to trees where they can chew the bark um, and allows them safer access to the grasses and forbs that are lying dormant below the snowpack. So now that you know the species, what it looks like, uh, its biology, kind of what that damage looks like, let's talk a little bit about our management options. There's five basic types of management options, two of the lethal options being trapping and poisoning. And I put these in yellow because any lethal option is going to have risks, inherent risk involved, especially if you're trying to do this in public spaces. And then our non-lethal options would be habitat alteration, where we change the, what the landscape looks like, human tolerance, so we're going to change our behavior, or exclusion, where we make that landscape inaccessible to the pocket gophers. First, it's a good idea to detect where your pocket gophers are. This is especially the case if you have a lot of pocket gopher mounds, you have um, high density of activity, so you can stamp down all the mounds, fill in any of the open holes. I like to flag them, but you don't necessarily need to. You can mark it with a, a little dot of paint so that it's not as obvious. Um, wait 24, 48 hours and to detect any new activity. And once you can see new fresh dirt, that's going to be easier for you to put a trap down there. It's also going to be easier for you to predict how close that pocket gopher is to any trees or sensitive landscaping that you want to protect. If you only have one mound or you only have a little run that's fairly obvious, you, you can skip this part because you'll know that that's the only place that the pocket gopher is. But it's just something you want to do if you have a lot of activity. I embedded two videos on this PowerPoint and um, these videos can be found on YouTube. I'll show you the titles of those in the next slide. Essentially, uh, what you are going to find um, is you're going to find that pocket gopher mound. You're going to move six to eight inches back and using a shovel, dig down about six to eight inches until you find the run. You can use the stake that you're going to put in for trapping to push gently down on the earth. And when that stake gives, that's how you know that you've found the tunnel. That's where you start digging six to eight inches down. And you can use that stake as a probe to find these side tunnels. Trapping can be a little bit scary of an idea in public spaces. 
However, because pocket gophers do live underground, the trapping is underground and is relatively low risk. It's up to you and your situation to decide if this is a good strategy for you, but I want to present it because it is a relatively low risk venture, especially when you only have one or two pocket gophers that you need to trap. You can do this in a few days uh, with minimal exposure uh, to the public. <clears throat> Most of my research that has been done shows that the Maccabee is the most effective trap to use in our soil types in Utah. And here with the pointer over there, you could see the video address. Um, this is uh, relatively easy to set up. It's relatively safe for the handler once it is set up. Uh, and it runs about five or six dollars a trap. You're gonna set this trap and place it inside the tunnel as so, and you can see here the YouTube address of how to get to that video that shows you how to actually find the burrows. Okay, so using that, you're going to tie some wire to the end of your trap, attach that wire to a stake on the outside of the tunnel. You can pound that stake close to the ground so that it's completely inconspicuous to anybody walking by. You're going to leave that trap for a day or two, come back and see if you've got the pocket gopher. These are the two videos that I like to use to explain to people how to actually find the tunnel system and then set the trap. Terry Salmon, who used to work for University of California Cooperative Extension, created this video, Finding Tunnel Systems. And then this video, trap placement. And these two will help you determine if this is something that you want to do and if this is something uh, easy enough for you to do. Another somewhat riskier idea is poison bait. Uh, again, because the pocket gophers live underground, you can, and eat underground, you can use this poison to control one or two pocket gophers in a couple days with relatively low risk to humans or pets. You do want to consider that these poisons do dissolve and then can, through move, so can move through your soil and your water. So that is something you want to consider when determining if you want to use poison bait and where the pocket gopher is. So similar to setting the trap, you would use the probe to find that main runway and uh, once you have that detected, the probe is actually loaded with the poison bait. You would twist the top turner of that probe and it drops a suitable amount of poison bait down into that tunnel. Twist a little bit more, lock it into place. It closes that opening so none of the poison can come out. And then you were to pull that, you pull that out of the ground. So. If done correctly, all the poison stays below ground, the plug stays closed, and humans and pets have no access to that poison. If trapping and poisoning are not good options for you, then I would definitely settle on some of these non-lethal options. I do not recommend fumigants or carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide as a lethal way to control pocket gophers in public settings. Many of the fumigants on the market need to be applied by a trained professional and if used incorrectly can be lethal to the applicator, uh, lethal to pets and lethal to humans um, that are downwind of those fumigants. Research that I've conducted in the past shows that these fumigants are no more successful than trapping or using the poison bait. So there's no real reason why you would want to use fumigants, which are very risky, instead of lethal control, such as trapping or poisoning. Um, and then if no lethal control options are suitable for your situation, let's talk about some of these non-lethal options. Exclusion may be the best option in that you know for sure that you are protecting your plants. 
It's not something where you want to fence off an entire football field, but you may use this as a method to fence off a section or side of the fenced yard. If you have an area where you know the pocket gophers are coming from. So depending on what you're trying to protect, this may be an affordable option for a section of fencing, but usually it's more affordable if we're just trying to exclude certain plants. So we use a half quarter inch to a half inch fence mesh buried about 18 inches below the surface around the root ball of a plant. Um, if you have a larger tree that's already been planted and you want to use it retroactively, you can go out um, a foot or so from that tree and place this mesh in the same way. So you go 18 inches below the ground and then you go several inches above the ground. We put the mesh above the ground because, as we mentioned before, pocket gophers are active in the winter. During the winter they're going to be moving above ground below the snow level and during this time they can access the bark of your trees if it's not excluded using that wire mesh. Some other ideas um, are alteration. I don't have a lot of data that shows how effective this would be in school grounds, um, but I just wanted to present them here as an idea. In a lot of agricultural settings, we suggest planting unattractive plants. So those are plants that have very shallow roots uh, or are not highly edible. In agricultural areas, we say plant about 50 feet foot buffer of grain. Um, I don't know that that's going to be the best idea for many school situations, but in some public areas maybe it would be. Uh, that's not just an idea that you can play around with or, or mowing uh, a border crop of grass that's a little bit more hardy, a little bit more tolerant, um, and thereby protecting um, your more expensive grasses if you're working on a, on a ball field or something to that effect. So you want to play around with that, find something that um, offers very little food. You can also consider a 50-foot buffer of mulch or gravel. Um, in this situation there's no roots below the ground so it creates sort of a blank zone below ground where nothing is growing. So a, a dispersing pocket gopher growing its burrow underground will come across sort of a barren patch where they would have to come above ground for food. They don't like to go more than a couple meters away from a hole, um, so they would pop up into a patch of gravel or a patch of mulch. mulch. Um, again, they can't eat that, so that's not attractive to them. Um, it also exposes them to any predators in the area, particularly avian predators. So where maybe a 50-foot buffer grain is a bad idea for you, mulch or gravel may do the trick. And the third option is tolerance. So you can gauge where that pocket gopher is. If there's no damage occurring except to a grassy area that's rarely used, or there's just a low population, or it's something that happens every once in a while, uh, you may just decide to roll down the tunnels in the winter. So once that snow melts, you've got those uh, pocket gopher casings. You can just roll that down and rake it in. The grass will grow over it. Uh, you may just decide to do that. Maybe the easiest, quickest option. Then I would encourage you to continually monitor that to make sure that the pocket gophers aren't coming closer into your fields or into your public spaces that you're trying to keep them out of. That might be a time where you decide to have tolerance but then start the exclusion process on the trees and shrubs nearby. For pocket gophers, it's best to consider your timing and combine a couple strategies. So we want to be proactive. We want to manage for the damage activity. If we start to see a little bit of damage on the edge, like in this photo, they just have a little bit of pocket gopher activity right here on the edge. Um, you want to monitor that. Maybe that's where you trap and you just put one trap in for a couple days and you get that problem pocket gopher and then you don't have to worry about it. Or you might decide that it's not worth it and you can just manage for that activity. 
um, I say use biology against the species. I mean that in that if you were trying to do a lethal control, you want to do that in the fall and reduce the potential reproducing population uh, before it mates in, in February, March, and April. You also want to consider the fact that it's a prey species that doesn't like to go far from its hole. So if you create a no-go zone, so an area where there's no food and there's no shelter, the pocket gopher is going to be less likely to want to use it. So you can, if you have a area where there's a high density of pocket gophers, maybe you do lethal control to reduce that population and then use some alteration and exclusion to manage and immediate any damage in the future. <clears throat> Before winter, make sure you're doing a retroactive exclusion on your plants that are close to recent grow activities. Um, that may be time for you to dig in some of this mesh around your mulch beds or around your sensitive trees. Um, consider that you could possibly dig that out in the spring if you want to. But it is just an idea um, and again, it's not all inclusive. I'm sure that there are other people out there that have got some ideas, but these are, those are the things that I think are suitable for public spaces that are easy to do, relatively low cost, and definitely low risk to the public and to the people in charge of implementing the strategies. Let's move on to voles. We have the same five basic options. Again, with lethal options, you have trapping issues, you have poisoning issues. With voles being active above ground, there's going to be a higher risk with these lethal options. But let's go through them just in case there's a situation that might be useful for you. The most common way to do lethal control is just to trap the voles. Um, you can just use the traditional snap traps placed inside the run and then we cover them with a plate or a pan or some corrugated tubing. Uh, it's not very safe if you have curious people or pets running around. Anybody can pick up that corrugated tubing, get their fingers stuck in that victor trap. However, it doesn't take very long to do the trapping. Because they're active year-round and they're active during the daytime, um, you can set up that tubing maybe when school's out for a few days uh, and you know that there isn't anybody going to be using that area. You could set that up, monitor it, check it two or three times a day. When you get the vole, remove it. So this isn't something that needs to be put out in a remote area and left for a long period of time. This is something you want to be checking every few hours while you have that out and about. Another popular option is to use poison baits for voles. With these, I would highly recommend using a commercial bait box. These bait boxes lock. The bait comes in blocks. It is labeled specifically for voles. Don't use bait listed for pocket gophers. Don't use grain baits. Uh, these things aren't formulated to kill the bowl in a timely way. You put grain baits in there, it can shake out and be accessible to people. It can only be used within 100 feet of man-made structures. It's not meant to be put out in the back 40 somewhere and not monitored. This is something that you want to maintain, keep your eye on. I suggest it because it is containable. Um, there's also some commercial boxes where the vole goes into the black box and it's killed inside so you can actually open it up, remove the vole, and then reset the trap uh, versus um, many of them where the vole comes in, grabs the poison, and then leaves and then dies elsewhere. Some concerns with poisoning and having the animal die elsewhere that that, that dead vole can then be picked up by a child or eaten by a domesticated animal and there could be uh, an indirect poisoning or indirect effect of that bait by the handling or consumption of a vole that's died in that manner. Again, this might be a good idea if you've got a spring break or something to that effect where you know there aren't going to be people around. It's something you could put be put out. You are inside of it. You are monitoring it. 
You can put it out for a couple of days and handle your problem. Non-lethal methods obviously are going to be much less risky uh, to humans and pets, um, but much more expensive. So for voles, the best method to handle them in a non-lethal way is to exclude them, much like with pocket gophers. So you would use the same hardware cloth, the quarter inch to half inch mesh, um, and put them around your trees. You don't need to bury them 18 inches below the soil, like with pocket gophers. They only need to go uh, about six inches below the soil, soil, but they need to go fairly high above the soil. The voles can climb, um, they're active, all winter long, active throughout the snow. So as that snowpack gets deeper, the voles can get higher and they can get to your trees and chew off that bark. It's very common for them to eat bark in the wintertime. It can be really, really expensive if you're trying to exclude an entire mulch bed or, or um, landscaping pod, but it is a good idea if you're just trying to get individual plants. The great thing about this is that because you're only going six inches below the soil, you can remove the stakes and remove the mesh in the springtime and you're not going to get that damage. This is really damage to trees uh, through eating of bark is really something that only occurs in the wintertime. Um, of course there are exceptions, but once there's green grass growing and there's seeds being produced, the vole does not want to eat bark. It's not tasty and it's not as nutritious as the other things that are growing. So you just need to have it there for the time that other food sources are limited and the voles are forced to try to eat that bark. Um, alteration is going to be hit or miss whether or not it's uh, successful. Um, good alteration tactics play upon the fact that a vole is a prey species. So it wants shelter all the time. It's running above ground trying to find food. So it really wants to run above ground in heavy cover. It may dart out from that heavy cover to get a little bit of food, but then it's gonna dart back. So strategies that reduce cover are gonna be the most effective. So you can clean any ditches or fallow areas, remove any wood piles, keep your grass mowed very low. Uh, and then much of the literature suggests if you mulch about two feet around your tree trunks, maybe a little bit more. That's enough of a border uh, that the vole is not want to get, does not want to get to that tree. Okay, so it's not going to access those leaves, it's not going to do any nibbling. Um, some publications suggest crown vetch as a border plant. Crown vetch isn't something that I would want growing on my property. Uh, it can be invasive and difficult to control. But if you were, say you had a fallow area next to your property that you had no authority to manage, you could potentially create this border of vetch that voles don't like to travel in, they don't like to eat, and then use mulch borders or gravel borders out two feet from that to try to min minimize the attractiveness of your area. That being said, if there's no other food around and yours is the best place to be, vo some voles are still going to risk covering that two feet of barren area to get to your food. If you remember, I mentioned that vole populations cycle. So it's really going to be every three or four years that you might see this boom of vole populations. Otherwise, you might only have one or two um, unless you're surrounded by agricultural fields or fallow fields that are creating basically a source for these vole populations. When you just have a low density, you may just choose to tolerate those voles. Uh, in the spring when the snow melts and you see a few runs, you just rake them over, fertilize the grass, and that'll rebound quite quickly. You won't really even know that you've got that there. Um, it's just when the vole density gets higher, that tolerance is going, isn't going to be an option uh, most people don't like to have their lawns covered by runs um, with feces hanging out in them. So it just creates a human health and safety concern. So we, we definitely want to avoid that. Several people have suggested using repellents. Um, best of my knowledge, thyrum 
is the only repellent labeled for use on trees. Or repellents is similar to deterrent. Uh, I don't really suggest using these only because they're short term and they're labor intensive. So you have to make sure you get all of the bush, all of the shrub, whatever crop you're trying to defend. And if it's high temperatures, that chemical is going to degrade quickly. You're going to have to reapply. If there's heavy rain or heavy moisture, it's, it could wash off and you're going to have to reapply. And so then you're left with a repellent or a deterrent that is transferable to the people that touch it. That may be your management operator, it could be students, it could be pets. Um, and so then it, again, it creates a bit of a safety concern. Now, of course, if it's labeled for use um, on trees, then it's probably safe to use or in public areas, but you want to check. So if you decide that repellents or deterrents are going to be one of your options, make sure you read the label, see if it's appropriate for use in public spaces where there are humans and pets in the area. There are labels for agricultural uses that are not labeled for resident or urban uses. So make sure that you're reading the label on the back of these repellents and deterrents. As with pocket gophers, vole management is about timing and combining the methods. Most of your damage occurs in winter, so most of your mitigation is going to occur in the fall. You want to make sure that grass is mown short, uh, so always, um, but definitely before the snowfall, this allows for less damage of the existing grass. You want to try to protect your trees with mesh, remove that board of vegetation, make sure any of your barren, your mulch, or your, your gravel deterrent borders are set up and in place and clear and ready to go. Lethal control can occur in the spring or fall. Remember that they're breeding in May and every three weeks there could be a new population of voles coming up. So if you have snow melting and then you realize, wow, I have a lot of voles on my property, you can do some lethal control right there in the spring and reduce that population. Conversely, you might see some snow melt and just see that you have some spot issues that you want to take care of but there's no indication that there's a huge population, in which case you might just monitor and tolerate that and see what happens. Uh, in the fall, when you, do, when you do have those high populations in the fall, remember that a lot of that's gonna die off. It's part of a cycle, but you can help it and have an additive effect if you do your trapping or your lethal control in the fall. That leaves less animals in the reproducing population come spring. So you want to be strategic about it, and it reduces your effort and maximizes the effect that you have. Trying to do damage management is really tricky in public spaces. There are many methods that we use in agricultural areas that are just not acceptable in schools, um, in libraries, or anywhere where there's kids running about. Uh, so. Again, to maximize your effectiveness, consider the animal's biology. Consider that it's a prey species, what kind of food it's trying to eat, when it's reproducing, and kind of use that against it. Try to, and that's gonna give you the biggest bang for the buck. If it's a low density animal, there's just very rare damage, um, you can decide to tolerate it and monitor, but also lethal control may work best at this time. You can just go ahead and try to trap out that one animal and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, if you are in a situation where you already have a high density, then you're going to have to combine your methods to get uh, the best effect. And if it's persistently a problem from year to year, you might, you're going to need to consider where those animals are coming from. What are the properties that are bordering yours? How can you use non-lethal control along those borders to minimize the voles and the pocket gophers coming onto your property? If you have any trouble whatsoever, or you think that you have a very specific, unique 